This property is a good example of how there's plenty of clearance on this property. From the irrigated lawn, it's essentially fire-free. It won't propagate the fire, it won't spread the fire. The surrounding landscaping is separated from the rest of the forest and there's a mixed wood. So in this particular case, it's got plenty of clearance. The real issue on this house was the wood roof that they've changed out. The wood roof would have dominated the, the likelihood for ignition on this house. Reducing combustible vegetation adjacent to the home also helps to reduce the potential for a fire involving the house. Well, here we have an example of a, of a home ignition zone that has a considerable amount of space between the house and the dense forest uh, beyond. The home, as well as its surroundings, is part of the home ignition zone. And so the non-combustible walls and the non-combustible roof have very low ignition. Every potential heat source in the zone must be evaluated, even a neighbor's home. If multiple homes share ignition zones, then each home becomes a potential heat source that could ignite the other homes. Solving this problem becomes a shared concern requiring cooperation and planning. The home ignition zone empowers people and neighborhoods to take relatively simple steps to save their homes and communities, even from the most intense blazes. Perhaps the greatest vulnerability in the home ignition zone is the threat posed by firebrands. Jack was first introduced to the importance of firebrands igniting homes in 1977 as a young research scientist in Patty Canyon, Montana. Initially, we could begin to see just a little bit of flame over this ridge and at the same time could see some of the firebrand ignitions, those spot ignitions from the burning embers that were coming out of this fire beginning to ignite on this hillside. The intense heat of a fire on the ridge generated swirling winds that carried and dropped burning embers on homes far in advance of the flames. We were right here on this road, so we were fairly close to this crown fire, a couple of hundred feet from this crown fire, and yet the, the radiation wasn't so intense to where it would have ignited the wood walls because we're more vulnerable to the heat than what, the, what wood walls are, but there was this tremendous blizzard of burning embers coming out of this intense fire. Severe wildfires commonly generate firebrand blizzards. Like the Patty Canyon fire, these blazes quickly race out of control. Firebrands are swept along fast-moving currents and deposited onto homes ahead of the fire, causing them to burn to the ground, even though the crown fire never came near them. Because firebrands are so small, we tend to ignore them and instead focus on the large flames. Ironically, we tend to pay a lot of attention to the flames that can be uh, relatively close to the, to the home and not ignite it and ignore those things that don't bother us very much. Oh, they're, they're highly inconvenient. If you're caught in, a, in an ember blizzard, you know, having these embers on the back of your neck or burning small holes in your clothes is obviously not, you know, a great experience, but, but it's not mortally threatening to us. And yet, this blizzard of firebrands can, just like snow, begin to collect and pile up in certain locations around the house. Our intuitions belie the truth. A tiny firebrand can be more devastating than a raging crown fire. But that doesn't mean that homeowners are helpless. If we consider a house as fuel and reduce the flammability of materials on and near it, we can protect against firebrands igniting our home. Vigilance begins with the roof, the most vulnerable part of the home to firebrands. The most flammable roofs, not surprisingly, are constructed of wooden shingles. Firebrands that land on or between the shingles can easily ignite the structure. To find safer, less flammable materials, Jack has conducted experiments on composition shingle roofs. What I did was to pile pine needles, actually a lot of us, gathered pine needles and put them on the roof uh, to a depth of about an inch and a half, and then we ignited it to demonstrate that the roof wouldn't ignite. It, it's somewhat dramatic to, to watch a surface fire spreading across a roof. Uh, it tends to be counterintuitive to our expectations, but you find that 
that composition shingles just don't carry fire. Experiments have also been conducted on siding and deck materials. I'm looking at materials, for example, exterior plywood, wall siding, and, and wood decking that uh, can always ignite from the firebrands that I deposit on the deck. And then I look at other materials at, to see how they compare with regard to ignitions. Initial results have determined that fiber cement siding has proven to be non-flammable. Still other areas around a home are vulnerable to catching fire. Any gaps or cracks in a structure or any place where combustible materials or firebrands can gather are ideal for sustaining ignitions. By conditioning the home ignition zone, we can prevent wildland urban fire disaster. It's been proven. When fires broke out in Bel Air, California in 1961, 95% of all homes with non-flammable roofs and a 30 to 50 foot buffer from fire survived. The 1990 Painted Cave fires in Santa Barbara, California experienced similar results. There, 86% of homes with non-flammable roofs and 30 foot separation from flames survived while other homes burned. Scientists like Jack Cohen have dramatically changed our understanding of wildfire. We now better understand how homes ignite, and we possess the remedies to save our homes. But that raises a question. Why should people take responsibility for their property? Isn't that the job of firefighters? We can't rely on fire agencies to uh, either keep the fire away or, or to keep our house from igniting. The wildland firefighter's job is to contain the wildfire. They go out and they, they remove vegetation to keep the fire from spreading and thereby we contain the fire that way. Wildfires can quickly become so overwhelming that firefighters are unable to protect individual homes. So the burden must fall elsewhere. When we think about how homes ignite during wildfires and realize that it's the ignition, home ignition zone that, that determines the vulnerability of our home and that by and large we own that and that we're the only ones that can do something, that means that we are going to have to participate in this problem as homeowners. The good news is that home survival isn't an all or nothing proposition. We don't have to completely rebuild our homes or re-landscape our yards. The goal is to minimize ignitions during a wildfire in order to contain the fire. Preparation, however, must begin long before smoke appears on the horizon. We've got to do things before the fire ignites. Those things like seasonal cleanup of needles around our house, changing the roof, uh, thinning out the forest that's next to our house. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we can't do when the threat becomes imminent. Saving homes demands a fundamental change in our way of thinking. To coexist peacefully with nature, we must learn to be compatible with wildfire. We must realize that wildfire is inevitable in nature, but that destruction of our property is avoidable. We can save our homes. It's up to us.